Thank you all for coming today. It's great to have an opportunity to speak to you for a moment about learning analytics, the power of data. These days, an increasing amount of learning takes place in online learning environments. Uh, some uh, blended and online learning environments that you might see in a K-12 school near you include systems like assessments on the right side, where students uh, solve mathematics problems in class or as homework, and the system uh, gives them scaffolding and feedback if they don't know it, gives them hints if they need it, and gives uh, formative information to teachers that they can use in the next day's class. Um, on the top left, Inkits, which is a system that students use to experiment with scientific simulations and learn science inquiry skills. Top center, another science environment, uh, EcoMove, where students go around a virtual world solving mysteries, uh, picking up frogs, taking them to the laboratory, studying them. Um, bottom left, you see Newton's Playground, a system used, uh, a, game lear a game used for learning physics, where kids have to get the ball to the balloon uh, by drawing objects and creating various physical um, levers and other, device, other simple machines. And finally, in the bottom center, Reasoning Mind, which is a story-based uh, learning environment, which is used by about 60,000 kids a year in Texas. Systems like Cognitive Tutor, which is another math online learning environment, Assistments, Alex, Reasoning Mind, are used by tens or even hundreds of thousands of K-12 students a year, one to five days a week. And these systems uh, have Beyond their uh, just immediate pedagogical benefits, they also have another benefit for education research, which is that they generate truly massive amounts of data. Every time a student does anything in these environments, whether it's uh, answering a question or asking for help or picking up a frog, uh, the system logs it and logs the context so we can learn from that. Uh, there are increasingly research communities emerging to study that data, including the Educational Data Mining Society and the Society for Learning Analytics Research, and uh, increasingly a community of researchers that's propping up here at Teachers College. In recent years, these communities have been able to use this kind of data to model a range of aspects of learners, including what learners know, including their metacognition, their thinking about their thinking and learning, uh, their engagement, I'll talk about that in a second, and their affect, or their emotion and context. And they're able to do it in a fashion that's, first of all, automated. Able to make assessments about students in real time with no human in the loop. And that's really useful because that way we can pass that information to teachers so that they can spend a little less time having to assess these things about students and a little more time able to act on them. Uh, these models are increasingly fine-grained. They're able to make assessments about students second by second. So we can actually know exactly when a student's getting frustrated or bored. They're validated. Increasingly, these models are demonstrated to apply to new students in new contexts. One of the things our group has been working on is making sure that these kind of models apply to urban, rural, and suburban students equally well. And finally, these models are increasingly predictive. They're increasingly predictive of student outcomes over the long term. So we're not just modeling where a student is every second, but we're modeling where they're going to be in the future based on that to give that kind of information to teachers about where a student is now and where they're going. So I'd like to give a few quick examples of this. Uh, first of all, learning measured in online learning systems, in some of Corbett and Anderson's work, predicts the kind of knowledge that students carry out of the system. Our group has been involved in uh, studying this algorithm and some related algorithms, and we can actually predict not just what a student is now, but what they'll carry out of the online learning environment, which leads to automated mastery learning that improves student learning. Systems that can figure out what a student knows so that when they're doing homework at night, it's uh, giving students the right amount of practice or opportunity to learn each of the various skills. And this, in turn, has been shown to improve standardized exam scores at scale. Another example would be help-seeking behaviors measured in online learning systems correlate to learning outcomes. And that leads to systems that teach more appropriate help-seeking behaviors, leading to lasting improvement in students' help-seeking skill. Uh, in some of our work, we've studied gaming the system. Gaming the system is when a student, instead of trying to learn the material, um, tries to subvert the opportunities for feedback to get through without learning. So for example, in online learning, a student might, uh, in a system that gives uh, many hints and finally gives you the answer, go click, 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 click on the help button, get the answer, type it in, click, 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 and so on. Or in one example, our lab has seen in some of our field work, a student typed in one, and that was wrong, and they tried two, and that was wrong. They tried three, four, five, six, seven, all the way to 38. <laughs> now, it turns out that students who engage in these behaviors don't learn as much about what they're supposed to be learning in the online system. <laughs> Shocking. 
Um, but, what, but that work to uh, make automated models of gaming system led to automated agents. Uh, you see uh, Scooter the Tutor here, uh, who responds to gaming and improves learning. Scooter actually pops up when students are gaming thank you, and uh, says, hey, you know, it looks like you didn't really learn the last thing you worked on. Let's give you more opportunities to learn that in a different way. That improved learning, uh, reduced gaming. You can guess kids didn't like it very much. Uh, some further work that, uh, that actually teaches students why gaming is harmful for their long-term outcomes has been more successful in not only reducing gaming and improving learning, but also doing something that kids enjoy. Another example would be boredom. Uh, automated models that can infer student boredom just from log files have been developed here and elsewhere. And these models have found that, first of all, boredom correlates to worse course performance. Students who are bored don't do as well in the course. Uh, they also do worse on the standardized exam. And uh, boredom in gaming a system in middle school math is negatively associated with attending college. And it actually turns out that how much a kid games is a better predictor of whether they're going to go to college than how much they miss class. And that's in part because kids can miss class for a lot of reasons, family problems, illness, whereas gaming is a very clear sign that the kid is not trying to learn in real time. In addition, our lab has found uh, work by uh, Sweet San Pedro, who is here today, star graduate student, um, that gaming system in middle school math is also negatively associated with choosing a STEM major. So kids uh, who show in middle school math that they, don't like middle sc that they don't like math by not taking it seriously are less likely to major in it later on. Um, now you might say, you know, these kind of models, why can't a teacher just do this? Why can't a researcher just go out to the field with a clipboard and take notes on it? Well, the answer is that it takes a lot of teacher time to evaluate these kind of things, and it takes a lot of researcher time. It's very expensive to send an expert field coder out to classrooms. By contrast, uh, these kind of automated models cost about a dollar per student hour of data, and that's much more affordable than field observations or video coding. So it's a new way of getting information to teachers more cheaply, and it's a new way of being able to do this kind of research at scale. So how do we use this information? First of all, we can study the impact of design choices. Does a different design lead to less boredom or gaming the system? We've actually worked with uh, companies like Reasoning Mind to figure out which of their contents are the most boring, which of their contents are the most frustrating, so they can fix it and make everything uh, uh, as good as possible. And we're working to redesign systems based on these findings. Also empower instructors. Let instructors and also guidance counselors know not just that a student's at risk, but why they're at risk and what kind of actionable levers there are that we might be able to adjust. Uh, we've had models for a while that can tell you a student's at risk of not going to college. A lot of these models have, have, based on, have been based on things like uh, referrals to the principal's office, which happen when uh, the student's already fairly seriously disengaged, based on things like grades, which happen at the end of the semester when it's hard for the teacher to do much, or even uh, information about the kid's demographics. Those variables can be very important, but it's not uh, all that actionable for a teacher or guidance counselor the same way. You can imagine the guidance counselor saying to a kid, well, you're less likely to go to college because your parents don't make very much money. Tell your parents to get better jobs. <laughs> These kind of models provide a, a more actionable lever on some of the same issues. Also, automated intervention, systems that adapt to help students re-engage and stick the course when the material's hard or boring. Towards improving sensitivity to individual differences between learners and improving learning outcomes. Early case studies suggest it can be done. The primary challenge we're working on these days is to scale these solutions to entire school years and into the diverse and large populations of students. That's a major focus of our lab here at Teachers College. To learn more, for those of you who are recently admitted students, uh, we have some course offerings uh, this coming fall that I would welcome you taking. Um, we also have uh, our massive online open course has become a massive online open textbook, um, available for free on the web to anybody in the world to just download and reuse however they want. So thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to our next speaker.